All right, my friends, I hope that you're having a wonderful day. This is attorney Hillary, and I want to talk to you today about the three reasons that a lot of immigrants get stuck in Ciudad Juarez, either short term, you know, for like a few weeks, more long term for a few years, or sometimes permanently because there's no way for them to legally come back. And along with that, I want to share with you ways to avoid that. Um, so this doesn't happen to you or your family member, or if you're an attorney um, listening in, this, this is a great way for you to avoid this for your client. So I want to start by kind of highlighting what the three things are, the three main issues, and then I'm going to go one by one with you know, what the problem is. I'm going to tell you a, a personal story, kind of a horror story I've heard from other clients because their families are contacting me because they have a family member who's stuck abroad and they need help and how I've been able to help them navigate this. And, and then really the, the big point of this, um, this podcast, this lesson, if you will, is I want to teach you the difference between a 601A waiver, which is called a provisional waiver, and the rest of the waivers, which are like pardon waivers, they're, they're usually filed with a form 601 and you have to get those adjudicated while you're outside the country. So I want to really teach what those are. I'm going to start with the heavy stuff first, specific to what those waivers are, and then we're going to work through things. So stay with me. This is going to be packed with lots of info. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm at New Frontier Immigration Law, and we answer our phones 24-7, 365, or in 2024, 366 days a year. So you can call us at New Frontier Immigration Law. You can Google us, and you'll find us. Okay. So what are the three things? Let's jump right into it. What are the three reasons, the most common reasons I see people go to Ciudad Juarez and not be able to come right back? And this is everybody's uh, kind of big fear when it when we talk about doing the process called consular processing is that something is going to go down at the consulate and my family member is going to get stuck there and I need him or her to be able to come right back. And this also applies if you're just doing consular processing and you already live outside of the country. Lots of people think like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go to the consulate. I finally have my interview. It's taken years for me to finally get my interview. And then the process gets extended because of the same reasons. So let's talk through them. The first one is there's a ground of inadmissibility. So you are applying for a green card. You're asking, and, and on some level, this 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 episode can apply to you, even if you're applying for a visa. Okay, you can have grounds of inadmissibility related to, to applying for a visa, like a, a fiance visa or a tourist visa, student visa, lots of things like that. But I'm really talking to people who are wanting to um, get their green card because this really is helpful for you, in particular. So. You're applying for a green card, which means you have to be what the U.S. government calls admissible. We want to say that you are allowed to be admitted into the United States. We're allowed to receive you. You don't have anything that gives you kind of an X on your file, which would make you inadmissible. You're not allowed in. So what happens at the consulate is you'll go and sometimes you'll already have a ground of inadmissibility. You may not know it. Your lawyer may not know it. Um, hopefully your lawyer, you've met with them before you leave and you, and they do tell you, look, this is, so you have kind of an, a heads up. You have a ground of inadmissibility. You're going to have to file a waiver once you get there. And this is the part of this, this episode I really want to clue you in on. And I may even do a, a totally separate episode so we can just title it and hopefully be able to help lots of people find it. But there are two different types of waivers. One is called a provisional waiver and one's just a regular old waiver. What's the difference between these? A provisional waiver helps you and it's filed on form 601A if you have unlawful presence and that's your ground of inadmissibility. So you can get your provisional waiver. The reason it's provisional is you get to file it while you're already in the United States. So the processing time, the approval, all of that will come while you're in the United States. So you don't have to risk leaving and then waiting for this waiver to get approved and hoping and kind of rolling the dice. You'll already know by the time you leave for your appointment 
for your Ciudad Juarez consulate appointment, you'll already know that the, your, your unlawful presence waiver has been approved. So you know that that form, that, that, that ground of inadmissibility, that basis for them possibly saying, look, I, I can't give you a green card. You'll already know that that's off the table. It's already been approved. It's not going to cause you any issues. Okay. Because it's already been approved. Now that's only for unlawful presence. So if you have other grounds of inadmissibility, then you have to wait in in this instance, I'm using Ciudad Juarez because so many of my clients are Mexican and that's where you're going to go for your consular processing is Ciudad Juarez. If you have another ground of inadmissibility, you're going to have to file that waiver after you get to the consulate in most circumstances. Now, there are other circumstances where you don't have to wait to get the notice from the consulate. Perhaps you've already gotten the notice at a prior interview that the reason you're getting denied is for this reason. You don't have to get another denial. But what I really want to emphasize is if this is your first time and you're like, I want to go and I don't want to get stuck. What, do, what is everything I can possibly do beforehand? I have bad news for you on some level. For a regular 601 waiver, if you have other grounds of inadmissibility that are not related to unlawful presence to t certain time you spent in the United States without permission, if it's related to things like alien smuggling, maybe you brought your, your young children to the United States with you when you first unlawfully entered the U.S., and now you're trying to correct all of that by going through the process, by going to Ciudad Juarez. If you, if you have an alien smuggling ground of inadmissibility, you're going to have to wait out getting the waiver filed and approved and then rescheduling your interview while you're in Mexico. Similarly, if you ever had any fraud or misrepresentation, you're going to have to file the 601 waiver after your interview in Ciudad Juarez. So you basically, I'm going to give you some examples, some real life examples. So we've had clients who um, they call us because they've already gone to the interview and they, they didn't know that they were going to have to go through this. And um, they got a denial. I, uh, I'm going to use a, a, a woman's name. It's not her real name, but we're going to use the woman's name as Maria. Okay. So Maria is 55 years old. She's been in Mexico for three years and her spouse is a lawful permanent resident and he lives in the United States. So Maria has applied for, she left voluntarily. She wasn't deported or anything like that. She left voluntarily, but it's only been three years. So she has filed and, um, and gotten her interview for um, her green card with the consulate. And she goes to the interview and the consulate finds that she is inadmissible, not only because she hasn't spent the, the 10 years abroad, so she has, she needs to file a 601 waiver for unlawful presence, number one. And number two, she admits to the consulate that she brought her daughter to the United States um, in the 90s. So that's an alien smuggling ground of inadmissibility that she has. And she also admits that when she first applied for her visa a few years ago, um, when she was trying to come back about a year and a half ago, she put on it on there that she had never been to the United States. And so she has a fraud and misrepresentation issue. So she has three grounds of inadmissibility. A 601 waiver is going to be all she files for all three of those grounds of inadmissibility, which is a good thing, okay? And because she has a qualifying relative, her lawful permanent resident spouse, she's going to be able to get a waiver. And, um, you know, she also in this, in real life, she had a daughter who was like uh, 27 years old, okay, who's a U.S. citizen. So she has all the ingredients that are necessary for her to get her green card, but she has to get the denial from the consulate first to then be able to file the waiver. The consulate basically has to say, yeah, we see that you're eligible for your green card except for these three things. And we see that you're eligible to waive them, but now I need for you to go home, get the waiver together and file it. And then I will adjudicate it. And then I can approve, I, I can make a new decision on your green card. So Maria will have to wait in Mexico for that whole time, particularly because you can't pre-adjudicate, the consulate can't pre-decide waivers for things like alien smuggling um, or fraud and misrepresentation or other potential inadmissibility grounds like those, okay? Um, let me give you another example. 
um, Juan entered the country when he was 18 years old. This was a long time ago. And now he, his, his dad is also a lawful permanent resident now. And Juan wants to consular process. How do I handle this? I go through every single possible ground of inadmissibility with him to make sure that the only thing he needs is the provisional 601A waiver. I determine that he's good to go. I do his fingerprints with the FBI. I do what's called a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request with every agency possible to make sure that Juan doesn't have any issues. I get all these police certification official letters so that when he goes to Ciudad Juarez, he can show them he has absolutely positively zero criminal history. I do all of that homework before I have Juan leave and go to Ciudad Juarez. I grill him as an attorney to make sure that he doesn't have any other issues because I don't want him to get stuck there without realizing that he's going to get stuck. It's a totally different experience, I believe, if someone knows that they're going to go to Ciudad Juarez for a while, but that they're going to eventually you know, be able to file the waiver and go through all this. What you don't want is the surprise. And I think that that's probably the most painful thing for people is the surprise of, hey, uh, you have a ground of inadmissibility and you need to file this waiver. And oh, by the way, it's going to take a long time. You're going to have to wait here a long time. No one wants that surprise. So in Juan's case, we would do the 601A and we would wait. We would file that while he's in the U.S. and we would wait. We would not send him to Ciudad Juarez for his appointment. We would let the consulate know that we have this waiver pending. Hold on to his case. Don't schedule it just yet. And then after it's approved, then we get the party started and we, we kickstart all of his consular processing stuff. So we get him in the line to be able to go to Ciudad Juarez. And then, you know, God willing, everything goes correctly there. And he comes back, um, you know, about two weeks later. Okay. So that is the difference between, um, you know, if, if Juan also, let's just add some facts to his case. If Juan also had a fraud and misrepresentation issue, I would tell Juan, you can file your 601A for your unlawful presence issue now, which is good. I'm so happy you can do that now and you can wait and live in the United States while that's pending. Because right now these are taking like almost four years to adjudicate. You do not want to be waiting in Mexico for four years when your family's here in the U.S., right? No one wants that situation. You want to be able to live your life like normal. And that's why it's called a provisional waiver. They're giving you this provision to be able to file this for unlawful presence while you're in the U.S. And then you can go deal with the rest of your issues it, from Mexico. But those, those 601s do not take that long while you're pending in Mexico. They don't take four years. The unlawful presence ones do take that long, but thank God you're able to do them in the U.S. So in that situation where Juan, I'm like making up a new case for you to follow me on just as an example. I learned through examples. I'm sure you do too. Is if Juan has two issues, two grounds of an admissibility, two reasons that the government's going to say you can't come in, like you, you can't do this, uh, you can't get your green card, we're just not allowed to grant it to you without waivers. The first being unlawful presence and the second being fraud and misrepresentation. So what he would do is we file the 601A while he's in the U.S., that gets approved. And then we send him to Ciudad Juarez and we tell him, we've got your um, 601, your waiver for the um, fraud and misrepresentation. We've got it all ready. Because frankly, we just did it for the, for the 601A. They're like going to be the same waiver, right? We just have to file it on a new form. We got to pay a new filing fee and it has to get re-adjudicated. The, the likelihood of Ciudad Juarez not approving um, a 601 after they've already, after the U.S. government, the same U.S. government has already approved a 601A is like not going to happen unless they find out like that the circumstances have changed somehow. But if you got a 601A approved and then six months later you're in Mexico and now it's time to get your 601 approved, it's on the same basis. It's the same reasons. They are very, very likely to approve it as well. But still, you got to wait it out while you're in Mexico. So Juan would know leaving uh, Arizona, where I'm at, he would know going to Ciudad Juarez, I'm going to be here for a little while because I know that they're going to tell me I need to file this waiver for my fraud and misrepresentation issue. That is a very good position to be in. There's no element of surprise there, which is awesome. Okay. 
So you have it in, your inadmissibility grounds where you can't get a waiver ahead of time. That's one reason people, number one, get surprised in Mexico. But number two, that's one reason they get stuck in Ciudad Juarez. And there really is no other way around it unless you can find a way to fix all of these issues in the United States. Let me tell you how those op, what those options are. And you can listen to other podcasts, watch other YouTube videos. You can call my office to learn more about them. But those would be through things like 245i, through things like a U visa, T visa, or through VAWA. Also possibly through asylum if you have a fear, um, a, a, a very, very strong asylum case to be able to file for. But that would be, I'm only mentioning that kind of as a, a very, very, very last option. We always talk to you before you leave the country to make sure that you don't have a fear so that I'm not sending you back somewhere where you might be harmed, um, potentially by your own government, because you got to go talk to the government while you're there. Okay. So we've now covered the first of the three issues we're going to talk about today. The first reason that a lot of people get stuck in Ciudad Juarez is they have a ground of inadmissibility that you have to file a waiver for. And, and, and I will caveat that by saying, if you don't have a family member who can help you with this waiver, you're stuck there long term. You, there's no time limit on things like fraud and misrepresentation. There's no amount of time you can just wait it out and it goes away. Unlike unlawful presence, you can just wait out unlawful presence and it will eventually just dissipate and it's no longer on your record, essentially. But things like fraud and misrepresentation, alien smuggling, um, certain criminal issues, those are with you forever. And so if you don't have a basis for getting them waived, my advice would be you have to make a really big, you have to make a very, um, informed decision before you go because you may not be coming back. And, and frankly, in those, in some of those cir circumstances, you wouldn't be coming back, not lawfully. Okay. So grounds of inadmissibility. The second issue is criminal issues that the consulate finds out about or criminal or other, just other issues that the consulate finds out about during the interview. And the third is medical exam issues, things that come up during the medical exam. So we've covered inadmissibility. Let's talk about criminal issues briefly, because this is like a whole body of law. And um, I, I want to just start this by saying this is the highlights. This is the trailer for the movie. This is not the whole story. OK, but a lot of clients will go. Um, and I have a, I have actually a, a really recent case where I told the client, do not go. I, I am not comfortable advising you as your attorney to go to, to your appointment. So this was a gentleman who he, um, he had with, with a notario filed for his, um, I went 30 through his U S citizen wife. And now it was time for him to, he had illegally entered to begin with. So he needed to file a 601 a waiver. And then he needed to go to his, um, consulate appointment in Ciudad Juarez. And he called us right before his appointment. He was about to leave. And he was like, I just want to talk to an actual lawyer who can tell me whether all this is okay or not. And we said, well, we cannot advise you on whether this is okay or not without doing a full kind of criminal scope and making sure that you don't have any criminal history and you don't have any other grounds of inadmissibility. Because just like I told you with the last example, what we don't want is to send you out of the country and you have a bunch of surprises. I don't like surprises. You definitely don't like surprises. And so what, what did we do? We did a full FOIA background check for him. I did his FBI background check as well. And um, I had him go to any of the local police departments that are necessary for him and get letters saying certified that he had no criminal history. Well, in his FBI, everybody, all the police records came back clean. But in his FBI fingerprint background check, it showed that a long, long time ago, he had been charged with statutory rape of having sex with a minor. Um, in Arizona, I think that's someone who's 16 or younger. Don't quote me. I'm not a criminal lawyer. We asked him about, hey, what is this? And he said, well, I, I got into trouble um, for having sex with my wife, we were, I was barely a couple years older than her and she was younger and I got into trouble for having sex with her, but we're married and she's the basis of my waiver. And like, they ended up throwing the case out. I was, uh, the case was dismissed, but I was initially arrested and charged, even though the case was later dismissed. I did not feel comfortable sending this gentleman 
to Ciudad Juarez with that explanation. Um, And here's why. With any green card application, you need to show that you're um, a person who's deserving of the discretion of the adjudicator to get the green card. So in their discretion, they think you're a good enough person to grant a green card. Um, A lot of things go wonky with the consulate in Ciudad Juarez. This is not a dig on Ciudad Juarez. This is not um, anything disparaging, but I say wonky because one day it'll be one thing and another day it might be another. And as attorneys, we learn about this and we gather data one case at a time. And that can be very frightening for individuals, for immigrants who want to go just get their green card. So my concern was that he would answer the question at the consulate and explain exactly what happened because the consulate is going to see that charge was made and that the case was dismissed. You would think this would be open and closed, but because it had to do with having sex with a minor and he's admitting to having sex with a minor when he was of age, he was over the age of 18. That made me very concerned that on the ground of discretion, the consulate could deny him. And so I had to give him my legal advice. And then, of course, he makes his own decision. I said, sir, I'm really concerned that this is going to be an issue for you. I told him the pros and cons of what may or may not happen. I may just be being very um, apprehensive or too risk adverse. But if the, the way I look at these cases is like, if this were my dad and my, my mom and dad have been married for like freaking forever. They got married when they were 17. My mom was 17. My dad was 18. My mom's parents had to sign a consent letter to let her get married because her birthday was like three days later when she turned 18, but they wanted to get married on a Saturday. Didn't want to wait until the following Saturday, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't there. My parents have been married for 45 years though. That's so crazy to think of. If my dad needed to go to Mexico, I kind of get emotional just thinking about it. My parents are total, uh, I love them, but they're kind of rednecks. Like they're not immigrants at all. Not that immigrants can't be rednecks, but the idea of my dad having to leave the country and leave my mom um, and possibly not ever get to come back and my mom needing to like sell their home here all by herself and up and move to a country she's not familiar with and in a language that she's not familiar with, it would terrify my mom. And they're in their sixties. You know, this would, this is truly not a feasible option for people like my parents. And this client I was working with, he's very close to my parents' age. And I just thought if he goes and he gets a denial based on discretion, there's no real appeal of this. Like it is, it's not an appealable um, thing. And what what would we do? We could reapply um, and we could reapply and reapply and reapply. But if they just keep saying no, then this gentleman is stuck outside the U.S. And I did not feel comfortable advising him to go for it. So I told him, I don't think that you should do this, sir. Um, and, and, you know, let's look for other options. And we were able to find other options that allow him to fix here in the U.S. without leaving. But I share that with you to say, there are, there are some issues that the consulate can look at that even if your case was dismissed, it can still kind of haunt you. And there's no removing it from your record because you have to, there's a question on the DS-260 on your green card application that specifically asks, have you ever been arrested for anything, even if you were not charged, even if the case was dismissed, da, 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 have you ever been arrested? You have to answer that. Otherwise, you're lying and now you're creating a fraud and misrepresentation issue. So you have to answer that honestly. And so this is going to come out one way or the other. It's going to come out in your interview. And you can't take your lawyer with you. Like, I can't go explain this on your behalf and try to wordsmith this to make it sound not as bad as perhaps it is or, or to make it sound as accurate as it is. So you're really on your own and have to advocate for yourself. And you need to talk to a lawyer before. And, and that's why I'm so thankful that he called us. Um, 
because we were able to do these extensive background checks and then have a conversation with him before he left because all of us just felt truly like he had dodged a bullet. He's disappointed because he thought he was so close all these years. He's been waiting to get his green card and now he has to start a different process. But truly, like I look into my figurative immigration crystal ball and I shake it and I look and say, this is such a better option than rolling the dice and possibly um, getting stuck there forever because that's what would happen. Oh, it just, it freaks me out. Okay. So that's criminal issues that may come up um, with the consulate and, and granted the consulate may be like, okay, yeah, that, I'm glad I, I get it. You guys shouldn't have done that. But if the police didn't want to charge you with it, um, then who am I to, to make this something that haunts you for the rest of your life? Off you go. But not every consulate's like that. So there we are. Number three, and then we're going to close this episode out. The three reasons that you, uh, that people may get stuck in Ciudad Juarez. One is grounds of inadmissibility. Two is criminal issues that may come up that even though they should be not a big deal, become a big deal because you have to have the discretion of the consulate to grant you the green card. You have to be a person they deem as a good person. Number three is issues that come up with the medical exam. So when you fix in the United States, you go to do your medical exam here in the U.S. No problem. We can actually get them to give us two copies of it and we can look at it before we even go into your interview, which is something I really love to do. So we get your copy, we keep it sealed and we give that to USCIS, but we get my copy. I open it and look at it to make sure that there are no surprises before your interview and before we submit it. Now, issues that have come up, not for my clients, but for other other people who have gone to Mexico and they've called me and said, bleeping, bleeping, bleep. I just did my um, interview and this is what, this is what they told me because of my medical exam. I'm going to talk about two things here that can come up on the medical exam. Well, really I'll talk about three things. One is in this day and age, it's 2024 when I'm recording this, you have to get the COVID vaccine. So some people get really bothered by the idea of getting the COVID vaccine, but it is a requirement in order for you to get your green card in this day and age. It may not be um, at some point in the future, but I sincerely believe it's it's going to be for the foreseeable future. I, I bet it'll be another 10 years before um, you're not required to get it. Some people even though they feel like it's a religious issue, um, even though they feel like it's um, a morality issue, no one should make me do this. I feel very, very bothered by getting the COVID vaccine. The waivers for getting the vaccines based on, um, you know, religious or other, for, you know, other uh, freedom of religion type um, purposes are are just not getting approved. So it's not impossible, but it's nearly impossible. So I would say that. If you don't want to get the COVID vaccine, you should not get your green card right now. There you go. You got to kind of, you have a, a choice to make and you should choose to get the vaccine if you want to get your green card and know that if you're going to Mexico, you're going to have to get the vaccine while you're in Mexico in order to proceed with your green card interview. So if you're someone who's like, absolutely, heck no, I'm not doing this, and you're already in Mexico, then we have a big problem and you can get stuck in Mexico for that. The more common things that come up though with your medical exam um, are tattoos and um, alcohol use issues. So with tattoos, one of the questions on the green card application is, have you ever basically been affiliated with any essentially gang organizations? And if you have any tattoos that can look like you were part of a gang or you were affiliating yourself somehow with a gang, that can be a really big problem. And you should talk to us before you go. So anything like, you know, uh, gosh, I'm so not a gangster. 16th Street, I think is a gang there. Are, and there are other gangs, like if you get teardrop tattoos and those sorts of things, they're going to, they're going to check your body out at the medical exam. So those are going to become very visible. Talk to an, a lawyer before you go, send text a picture to your lawyer, obviously with their consent. So they know what they're looking at before, before he or she opens up the picture, especially depending on where it's at on your body. But you're going to want to have legal advice on whether this tattoo is an issue. And if it is, we got to have a conversation before you go to Mexico. You do not want to be at the doctor's office in Mexico and being like, oh, crap. Now I got to explain what this is and hope that they believe me. We don't want that. The most common medical related issue, though, is alcohol use. 
So one of the questions on the green card application is, are you a, are you a habitual drunkard? Are you someone who regularly gets drunk? There's not a lot of case law and a lot of input on what habitual drunkard is. But what I will say is that you want to be really thoughtful about how you answer the doctor's questions with how much do you drink? Because even getting drunk every single Friday night, maybe it's just one night a week, could be considered being a habitual drunkard. Having three or more drinks per day, even if they are spread out over the course of the entire day, could be considered to be a habitual drunkard. It's, so you can get, it's a really gray area and it's a, it's a, frankly kind of a booby trap in my opinion, where if you admit to regularly using alcohol, you can, you can be found to be a habitual drunkard. And that can be a really big problem because then you have to show you're going to get a denial at the interview. And then you have to go back in and show that you have re rehabilitated yourself. So while you're in Mexico, you would need to go to like AA meetings and uh, maybe, maybe rehab. And if you're like, I don't have an, a, an alcohol abuse problem. I just answered honestly that I drink three beers a day when I get off work. That could be a really big problem for you. So again, this is something to talk to an immigration lawyer, especially who practices a lot at your specific consulate to figure out, you know, what's the best legal advice and how can we prepare you best before your interview? And let me tell you what that would be if I were talking to you. I would say quit drinking or um, drink one drink a day for a, a, an extended period of time before you go to your consulate interview. That way you can honestly tell the doctor when they ask, how many drinks do you have per week? You can say seven or less rather than saying, what's seven times three? 21 or less. Okay. Because 21 drinks a week sounds like a lot. If I'm a medical doctor who's assessing whether you abuse alcohol and you are a habitual drunkard. So I just want to give you that heads up. Um, and I also want to share because like being sober has been the best thing in the whole world for me. I'm just past a thousand days of being alcohol free and it's been amazing. So to the extent that that's helpful for you, I used to be a habitual drunkard. Even as an immigration lawyer, I abused alcohol. I drank way too much every single freaking day. It was the way I managed my stress. So um, I have a lot of empathy for you. If you're someone who that's your stress management because Hey, it is really hard um, just being an immigration lawyer. I frankly cannot imagine what it would be like actually being the immigrant who has to go through this process because I'm just advising about it. I'm not walking in these shoes. So I have a ton of empathy for you, zero judgment about how you're processing stress or relaxing or just having a good time. But what I will say is, that can have very detrimental consequences for you. And I don't want you to get screwed by getting to Ciudad Juarez, answering honestly, which we do. We need to answer honestly, but let's go in with an honest answer. That's not going to get us into trouble, right? To get us into having problems. As we end here today, I'm going to wrap it up and say, there are three main reasons I see clients get stuck in Ciudad Juarez. The first is grounds of inadmissibility that they either knew about or didn't know about, but the consulate has said, you can't get your green card because of this issue. And now we have to solve it while you're in Mexico rather than while you're in um, the United States. The second is criminal issues that the consulate either finds out about or just is an issue that, that becomes um, more of a problem than initially anticipated. And the third is things that come up during your medical exam, most, in, most of the time relating to um, alcohol or drug use. So anytime we talk about those two things, if, they, if you have that happening in your life, please contact an immigration lawyer. You can call me before you go to your interview, because especially before you go to your medical exam, because you're going to want to know What's the honest way for me to answer this question so that number one, I'm always telling the truth, but number two, I'm not getting myself in trouble. Like I don't want to, um, I don't want to make life harder for myself by being honest and we can help you with that. My philosophy is there's always a way to be transparent and to be honest and to do all of this the right way, because what's the point in getting your papers if you still have to look over your shoulder, right? My friend, have a wonderful day. Um, keep fighting the good fight and tune in for another episode. If this is helpful for you, please share it with a friend and I'll see you around.